Sound is good? Can you hear me? Okay. May I ask the Dutch folks, please, to be quiet now? A friend of mine. Okay. So welcome to the first session after the lunch break. I know we all have uh, the PLD, the post-lunch dip, but I hope I keep you awake. Uh, my session is, oh, not yet, go back. My session is not technical, it's more about when you're getting, uh, becoming the old guy, you see all this, yes, I feel old sometimes, that you f see that things, it's not all about technique. We are all in the technique, we're all technical people, so we try to solve problems by technique. But the problems are not solved by the te technique, it's solved by interaction communication. And that's, I want to share more about what I experienced in my like 20 years in uh, contracting, 12 years in security contracting, where I think things go wrong. So, briefly about myself, um, I have the honor to be a chairman of the board of directors of the OWA Foundation. That's a huge honor and responsibility in my eyes. In my previous uh, work time, I have been contracting, I will be leaving contracting after 20 years. It's quite nice for me, releasing, I hope. We will see how I will like it. Uh, and I do a lot for OWASP. So, that's enough now. So, I, many years back, I had a new motorbike, and I promised my wife vacation, and she eventually got some weeks. So, we took the motorbike up to the North Cup. And going up to the North Cup means it's not remote as in the 70s, but it's still quite remote. You have no internet connection. And you all know you're really in the business, you do security, you're consulting security, and we all know what would happen if I leave. Like this was thriving me, not taking vacation because I was like, oh, so much to do. But then I was on my motorbike, my wife, going to North Cove, no internet connection. And you know what? You come back and nothing big happened. The world was still turning, people were still fed with the supply chain still worked, we could still do the bank transaction. But the whole fear, uncertainty, disorder, like, oh, what could all go wrong? It's not that bad. It's not a disaster. And yes, we get hacked, we get everything, but it's not that it stop, the world will stop turning. And then, in the time on the motorbike, I like the motorbike because you have your hands off the keyboard and you're driving, and you have to have your mind on the road. Definitely, if you like sport is driving, otherwise things go wrong. And your mind has time to do other stuff. And I recall a presentation I saw on TED Talks from, I'm oh, sorry, Ernesto Ciolini, and I will take this as a reference. But first to start with, when you are looking at how people create their teams, it's people create their teams by adding the same type of people into it. I've been traveling a lot. In Eastern Europe, I see there's a 50-50 balance between male and female security people and developers. And I see in Western Europe, we are lucky if you see one. If I look here, we have, a, I think, two females in the room. It's, we are adding just more of the same to our team. When you are going back from this, I think it was the 2000 or end of 90s, I can't even recall when it started, we had all these things about thinking out of the box. You ever heard about that? Thinking out of the box? Who can think out of the box? Nobody can, because the box is you. The box is all you bring with you, over three females, I see, hey, we have a very high score now. So with the box means that's you, and the box of your project, of your team, is what you add to it. But if you add the same type of box to your team, the box is not getting bigger, it's just more of the same. What I really pity is that we're always adding the same type of people, like techies, and average quite young, because how long can you be a developer? Most of the time, you start in Western Europe, when you are contracting, you are a junior for how long? For how long are you a junior developer? What do you think? When you come from university and you start the first job at a company, definitely in a contracting company, you are a junior for six months, maybe a year when you are slow. So after six months, you have to become a senior because we have to raise the hourly rate. And then after three months, what is going on to be? when you will be a senior. So after four years, you are supposed to be senior. And people say, yes, but I really got nothing I do. Yes, you're a context meta specialist, but it does not make you a senior consultant. What we need to add a box 
uh, the standard box of our teams is to add different backgrounds, different genders and different age, different experiences. I have uh, helped the team of uh, mobile developers and one of the team was 52. And the rest of the team were the typical uh, young, driven app developers, 25, 26, they were like, this one guy is 52, huh? double the age. They were like, he is 52, he does mobile development. I was like, yes, it's Java. Like, no, 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 it's mobile. And he actually took the role of his responsibility when you're young, older. It's like, we all, when we're young, strive, and we have to go like, hey, this new technology, let's all go there. It's like, that's how we conquer the world. It's like, hey, there's a cliff, let's all jump down the cliff, let's see what happens. And then the older guy's like, hmm, maybe not all at once. And that's actually the role he took. He took the role about thinking of what could possibly happen. So when they had like a new framework, new technology, they all want to go jump down the cliff. He was like, hmm, maybe start with a small proof of concept. And that's the responsibility we have when we are older. And of course, we have to strive the younger ones. We don't have to frustrate them. So Box is about adding different backgrounds, ages, and genders in your team. And then you will extend the team. So as I said, on the motorbike, I recall the old tech talk. It has nothing to do with security. It's an Cialini, and I really encourage you to watch it. And here's this perfect way how he described his experience back in the 70s, being young and motivated and doing aid work in Africa. So he was a young some guy, and like, oh, in Africa, people starve. Apparently, they cannot grow food. But he's Italian. They're very good and grow vegetables. So we can solve their problem. So he flew to Africa, to I always forget the uh, country. So they flew there, I think Zaire or Zimbabwe, I'm not sure. They found a river that's annual that floods the bank, so it's very fertile ground, and they grow tomatoes. And he says in a very special way, like in Italy, tomatoes like this, there are tomatoes were like that, and they were really happy. They're helping the population of poor Africans who apparently have no clue to grow vegetables. Do you think this really was a problem? It was not. So the vegetables were about to be harvested, and all the hippos came and ate all the vegetables, all the tomatoes. And they were like, oh, what's going on? Where do the hippos come from? And the locals said, that is why we don't grow vegetables here. Because the hippos come and will eat everything. They said, why didn't you tell us? He said, you didn't ask. You just said, we will do this. We will do this that way. And I thought, this is actually how a lot of security people talk to developers. This talk is about, I don't want you to waste, because NFC Lunini says, at least we fed the hippos. Other aid workers just spending money and nothing happens. And I see hippos as things where you can waste time and money, resources, for something you don't want and it's totally unnecessary. That's my analogy. So that's the hippo cell we have to be aware of. And we are causing that as software developer. Who is software developer here? Are you proud of this? Like, hey, hey, developers, come on. Hey, developers. That's a problem with developers, they're introverts. <laughs> it's really a problem. Because who is selling the software? The sales guys. Are any sales guys here? Because they're the extroverts, they're like outgoing. I had it in my previous company. I was a, secure, a software architect, and we had this specialist expert, uh, estimates about how many hours something will take. He comes down to me like, this is your estimate. I said, that's my name on it. Figures are right. Yes, it's my estimate. He says, it's 250 hours too much. I was like, beg your pardon? I sold it for less. I said, wait a minute. You sold it for less, not taking into account my expert estimate. Yes. I said, so? And then he said, we have to put it down 250 hours. And I looked at it and said, oh, it's easy. Stripe something out and give it back to him. He, what did you just do? He said, you have no web interface. He said, yes, but it has to be a web application. Technically speaking, it's running on an application server. It's a web application. And I was like, uh, but you cannot do this. He's like, you gave me no fact why I should change my opinion. It has my name on it. I'm not changing it. And he was like, I will talk to your manager. But I went into IT. 
almost 30. I come from an industry where the human interaction is much more, let's say, masculine. I was not impressed by him. Like, I'm six foot four, long hair. Like, what are you trying to do here? <laughs> I'm not 25, skinny developer. I'm 100, cuddle plus, older guy. You're not intimidating. I always go outside and I'm a pacifist. He said, I will see your manager. He's like, yes, please, go. He knows me. Good luck. <laughs> but I am not the average developer. Most developers, introverts are younger. I mean, something comes by the business. Like, oh, we cannot do it. You ruin the company when you do that. What will happen? What will happen? They sell it for 250 hours less, and the developer will do overtime to make it happen. It's not in balance in social in communication. So the same thing happens with security. There are some myths about security. We create ourselves. Like the fear, uncertainty, and disorder. Things are like, how can we sell security? And what we did, how did we sell security in the past? We are the security specialists. What is the rest doing? Sorry? Yeah. Good. So how did we sell security in the past? The fear, uncertainty, disorder. Huh? Everything goes wrong. And we also say, because we have to charge money for security services. So how we do it? Security is serious. Huh? Have we thought about that? And it's expensive. Security, you cannot do it yourself. It's expensive. You have to hire the very expensive, uh, buy the very expensive tools and get a very expensive security consultant in your company. Otherwise, you will fail. What else we do? Security is complex. Oh, you can do security. This is who we are master brains, like hackers. Are there any hackers in the room? Okay. I see a lot of hackers coming like, oh, I'm super cool because I'm a hacker. I'm smarter than you developer because I can break your stuff. Yeah, right. So we say it's expensive and it's complex. How are projects run on time and budget? What does a project leader don't want in his project or scrum master or whatever? What they do not want? Something that is expensive and complex. That's how we solve security. It's complex and expensive. So no wonder they don't want to have security in the project. Like security, oh no, money and time. No, we don't want any security requirements, otherwise we will fail. This is very weird. Security is not complex. So let's see how we should do it. And that's a lot of lessons I learned from Ernesto Serrini's talk. And I again, encourage you to watch it. It's called, want to help somebody shut up and listen. First, don't be the main security guy. I see it many times. So they don't, as I said, hackers come to uh, developers, and not pointing at you that you do it wrong, but uh, so we come in security. We do the security mind, uh, check. Huh? I had an assessment. It was a Java backend, Android, iOS, front end. And the business said, can you do the security check in 20 hours, security code review? I said, 20 hours? Yes. Said, how many teams worked on the software? How many months? Yeah, it was three teams, uh, front end, Java, front end, uh, Android, iOS, and back end Java, three teams, and about six to nine months. Can you expect me to validate the security in 20 hours? Not working. I said, why not? What are you going to do? He said, now let's start with talking to the team, every team, a two hour intake. He said, you want to talk to our team? Said, yes. We never had that. I said, I'm, I don't care. I will talk to the team first. And when I approach the teams, you know how they responded? Any experience? They're like, oh, you're coming here doing the security check on our software. Do you guess what I said? No. They're like, what? No? No. We, together, will look at our application, see where we can improve it. I will be the grower to make happen what you didn't get the time and the money for. Together, we improve the quality of your software. And first, they were like, this is awkward. This is not how we used to do, talk to security people to us. Normally, they are somewhere remote. Huh? They do the security magic, the black magic of hacking. And out comes a PDF report. They say, no, you don't get a PDF report from me. Say, what? But, but we need this. Yes, I said, we do a business summary. But we will look in your software, in your process, and whatever you find, 
and we see how we can improve this together. Don't upset. You can see, I had a very good tweet from Mark Miller uh, on the DevOps uh, thing just <coughs> like a week ago in London. And he was saying, if you make my life hard, I will take shortcuts and do stupid things. We as security people tend to like, we have to measure it. Like these days we have DevSecOps, DevOps, Agile, Scrum. So the security people are like, oh no, I lose control of my teams. So what do we do? We put in security toll gates. When we go from development to test, we need instead a code review. We go from test to acceptance, we need a dynamic scan. And from uh, acceptance to production, we need a pen test, isn't it? And every time, how what is the feedback loop? So when you do a code review, the feedback loop is average three to four weeks. Isn't it weird? We are agile, we are DevOps, continuous development. So the teams have sprint cycles of two weeks max. So you're working on something now, you're recording, then you get a code review, so you have the next sprint, no feedback, and the next sprint, and then suddenly, ah, you remember, two sprints ago, this was your code, it was not good. Whom of you knows what he did last week Thursday? No. Hey, you did. Hey, you're German. Uh, nobody knows in detail what he did last week. Imagine four weeks back. Yeah, if you can choose my agenda, I can roughly recompile what I did. But nobody knows, and it's definitely not in detail. But that's how we address our developers. Like, ah, oh, you did this two sprints back, uh, no, nah, not good. And then another sprint, then you get a dynamic scan result. It's like, oh, and this is all, you also not did. It's like, yeah, but I had a code review check, I already solved it. Not on my code. It's not working. So don't make their life harder and able. So how to do it? Be visible. Home of you works together in a company where they have developers. So being a security guy in a company with developers. Who sits with the developers on a weekly, at least, or daily basis? That is so important. When they don't know you, how do you know where to ask? I see many times still, as I said, if it is external, they do it like all remotely, the black match of security. And when they're internal, it's a complete different department. I once had a security awareness training. It was on one floor, you go up the elevator, and on one side was the business, on the other side were the techies. And the meeting rooms were in the middle. The first 10 minutes we spent, them introducing each other. They have seen each other, but they think, oh, this business, or, oh, there's a techies, not talking to each other. It's like, this was the first goal uh, gain in this whole meeting, the first time they talked to each other. Isn't that weird? Meetings are so important. A meeting is not only business. Meeting is going out for drinks, going out for dinner, have some social activity. In a company I worked in the past, they had units, they have done every technology you want. It's like a big contracting company, they had Java, .NET, Oracle, PHP, whatever, Uniface, COBOL. COBOL is cool. So they had all this, and the units were combined by region and not by expertise. And I really loved it, and I hated when they skipped it. Because the first time I came in, I was like, hi, I'm the new guy. And there was like this group sitting there. It's like, hi, I'm the new guy. And they were like, uh, yeah, we heard about you. You're going to Java. Java's over there. I said, yes, but what are you doing? It's like, no, no, we do COBOL. Those are the Java guys. And the next table was like, oh, we do Microsoft. You, you should be over there. We don't talk to my Java people. And it was always like that. It's very normal. When you look at each other, <coughs> sorry, who is sitting next to somebody he knows of you? Who is sitting next to somebody he doesn't know? Yeah. But there's still a gap between. It's very normal for humans. You know this, some people laugh about it, and for example, when you're British or Dutch, and you go on vacation, and then you have all these other Dutch or British or Germans come up to you, like, oh, I know them, I can relate, it's the same nationality or same language. It's very normal that we want to cluster the people we know and have the same background. But it's so great to go out and see other people, sit next to other people, talk about what they're doing, understanding their complexity is so important. The only way to understand it is not always in a business meeting. In a meeting, it's worthless. 
And then security, when you go there and they have to talk about the project, and the manager's on the table, you hear nothing about it. Because the manager's next to it, and so it's all good. All, everything I ask is like, oh no, it's in cut shot. I smoke, and I said, most people, I should force them to smoke. Or at least go outside for a walk. Because when you go outside, in another context, you hear everything. And they ask you different questions. It's very normal, people don't want to be asked the stupid question. Because who, imagine if I ask somebody something, that other things like, oh, this is stupid. And actually, this is what's got me hooked in all was that we don't have that. It's not this one guy doing security, wow, whatever, rocket science for 20 years. He's like half God, and here is the humble, just starting guy. No, we're all the same. We all strive for the same. And this is the environment you have to create, that you can ask everything. So meet each other, understand them, and then pay attention. Security is known to be the ministry of no. Why? Because somebody said, ah, oh, I have to this idea. No. No security approval. You can't do that. No. And this is something that will not improve security, because they will do it anyway. It's like the email requirement. Like, oh, email attachment must be file shade. I cannot send this extension, not this size of emails. So what people will do? We all have internet connection now, and everybody has a Google account. So, okay, I cannot use my corporate email address. Let's use Google, isn't it? People will bypass whatever stupid rule you have if they don't understand the rule. And making rules understandable is to tell them why they are in place. In the Netherlands, traffic fines, speeding fines, are quite high. If that's 100 km an hour and you go 105, it's easily 30 bucks, something like that. That's really ignoring. Like if you're going like three kilometers an hour too fast, it costs you 50 bucks. And between Amsterdam and Utrecht, they have a control over distance. So they take you and they read your license plate when you get intersection, and 20 or 30 kilometers later, they check again and do the average of your speed, and they will decide then if you have speeded or not. Why do people stick to the rule? Because of the height of the fine. So you teach people, I cannot drive too fast where I have a control. So everywhere else, apparently it's okay because I'm only not speeding because of the control and not because of the consequences of insecurity or traffic uh, uh, flow. You teach people the wrong reason. If I teach them to stick to a rule because it's a rule and not make them understand why the rule is in place and what you try to solve, they will not help you to understand the rule, maybe improve the rule, they will fight the rule. Or they will just duck to avoid the fine. There's a story about a big American company that had a security problem, and they got a secure code review tool. Like this, you have to comply to, and there will not be any high or medium or, or findings anymore. But it didn't tell about the tool acceptance. It was a pain in the, you know where, to apply to it, it reduced the speed, it was cumbersome. So they didn't write a bit of the code. They wrote code the security tools could not discover. So your problem is even worse because now you don't know the security reason what's in there. And there's also one about acceptance. So we, we said security tools, and I like Gary McCraw's statement, they're not security tools are bad or meters because they tell you how bad software is, not how good. We are looking for issues. So if you have a true positive, the tool says this is an issue and it's true when I validate it. What is a false positive? I try not to ask rhetorical questions. What is a false positive? You know that? What is a false positive? Anybody? Yeah, so it's not, you look, we give you the issue, but it's not a relevant issue. So false positive is also a very, everybody's like said it's not a false positive, but sometimes the measure is outside of the source code, so it's not a relevant issue. And a false negative is, what is a false negative? Yes? I'm not sure what you're saying about the website. Yeah, so the tool says everything is okay, but there's a security issue. So for you, the question, what is more dangerous? A false positive or false negative? Who thinks a false positive is more dangerous than a false negative? Yeah, three. Who, thi oh, no. Who thinks a false negative is more dangerous than a false positive? That's a security guy. 
Because when you want to eliminate all the false negatives, that means you have to validate everything. <coughs> and that the developer is not paid to validate the tool outcome. So for the developer, a false neg positive is most dangerous. Because when I give you 10 issues, and five are not relevant, or even four are not relevant, what do you think then? This is a shitty tool. I'm, not pa I'm paid to write source code. I'm not paid to uh, estimate the quality of the tool. For our security people, I don't want to have any false negative. I want to go through all the false positives because I want to know what's going on, but the developer only gives the issues that are relevant. No false positive. Better less than more. And this is tool acceptance. Again, if you make my life hard, I will take shortcuts and do stupid things. We have to enable them. All the tools we give them is enablement. And when they come with some business idea, don't start with saying no. It's like, let's go grab a coffee. Sit apart, sit down, and pay attention. And when you pay attention, you will understand that context. As I said, hackers are uh, trying to say, oh, I'm very smart, I'm a super cool hacker. I wrote this su super cool tool. You can download it from GitHub, but don't look at the source code because I, I'm a crappy coder. When you look for security vulnerabilities, it's very easy. To write it secure is the hard part. I started my career as a mechanic for injection molding machines. And we had PLC programs or boards. And sometimes it went wrong. And the funny thing is, with industry, when something goes wrong, it's very impressive and expensive, and the business doesn't like it. So when something came wrong, our developer descended to the production area. And guess what was his statement, his first question? What have you done this time? Is that what we do, huh? Blame the user, you know? What has it done this time? You know, I broke this machine, this robot, perfectly. It must have been you. And I couldn't stand it because we had the same issue that happened now and then. So I social engineered myself to the PLC code, the letter diagrams. I taught myself PLC programming to understand the code, and I had only one goal, to find the problem, and I found it. So the next day, I come there, he, I, I'm been busy, he comes, to, I see him, I come up to him, I found your problem, I found your bug. What do you think, he jumped up, hugged me, and we are friends for life? What do you think? No, because I addressed him wrongly. Me, the grease monkey, and he, the developer, and I said, ah, oh, I found your bug. It's also the attitude. Because he had a wrong attitude, like, I am the developer, and you are the grease monkey. Like, I am the super hacker, and you're the poor coder. I hear security people so many times, like, oh, developers don't want the right secure software. Where are the developers? Do you care about software quality? Yes, otherwise you wouldn't be here. But we expect you to come to the security conference. Where are the security people? Have you been at the developer conferences? Yeah, some, that's what you need. We have to go to them and teach them and not expect them to come to us. An average developer may go to one or, if you're lucky, two conferences a year. And you have a developer. Why would they choose a security conference? The developer conference, it's about their subject. So we have to go there and reach out to them and understand their context. And it's getting more and more complex and faster. So they are not really appreciated. I pity developers these days. You are really sorry. I'm sorry for you. Because you are too late. I want this functionality now, not in two weeks, not in three. And now, give it to me. You are too expensive. And it doesn't again does what I expected it to do, isn't it? And you're too much expensive, I will outsource you. Maybe close source you to uh, East Europe or far away to India. I don't have to see you anymore. That's really feeling appreciated, isn't it? No, not really, isn't it? What we need is craftsmanship and appreciation. Everybody, what, no matter what he is doing, if he, is, he or she is appreciated in their work, they will do a better job. And we do a better job they do more quality, we need craftsmanship. That means that we have to enable them to do so and not hinder them. Appreciation, that's key. Look at them, the small initiative, appreciate the small stuff, the, the sparking in the eyes when they talk about the software. 
And what we have to tell them is how to write this functionality on a responsible way. Not saying no, it's like this is a great idea. And then ask questions, what would, ha would happen if this would be the case? What would happen if that? So they think and come with a solution and thought about what are the dangers and impossibilities they didn't thought about. Nourish them, encourage them. Support them. When I say no, it will not help. That's a very nice analogy. I know it's not true, but it's a nice thing about analogies. People are dead, so we can take, take, say whatever we say meant. We want them to have been said. And one thing is that Henry Ford has been asked, why, why has a car brakes? Why did you add brakes to a car? You heard about its analogy? So I asked you, why does Henry Ford add brakes to the cars? What do you think? You're not really responsive. It's a PLD, yeah? So people then said, uh, suppose like to brake, isn't it? A brake is to stop. But it's a negative thing. To enabling going faster on a responsible way. That's why we have brakes. Think in a positive way, not in a negative way. We have brakes because then we can go a higher speed on a responsible way. We have secure TLS because we want to exchange data in transit encryption. We make it possible on a, uh, possible on a responsible way. Shut up and listen what they want. Help them and nourish them. Like the current small ent uh, entrepreneur does in South Africa, like see who is interested and feed them and catch them with stories. Developers would want to do a good quality job. They want to do craftsmanship, but they need possibilities and they need encouragement and appreciation. And there's another thing that's quite funny. Who of you has friends that are not in the IT business? Oh, good. So you are the guys who fix their computers, isn't it? <laughs> I have a friend, he calls me now and then. He says, oh, I broke Google. Said, oh my God, what did you do? It was an icon, a Chrome icon on his computer. So internet was broken or Google was broken if it does not work. We have to understand that is the world of understanding of the user. And a good friend of mine, he opened it once a conference with a very nice story that really happened. His wife is a nurse, and she won some tickets for a free concert. And it was a PDF. So she opened the email, the PDF to, uh, has been read. She clicks on the link because she says, click on this link and add this code in the box you see. So she clicks on the link, she looks on the website, she adds the code, and nothing happens. She tries it five times, and then she's like, to her husband, who's an IT guy, Ah, oh, you stupid IT people, look, it doesn't work. So he looks at it, clicks the link, and says, yes, it's a broken link. You think your friends who are not in IT know what a broken link is? And it was a not bad website, so they redirect you to a home page. What is the one box in a home page where you can add something? It's a search field. So he says, ah, you should not do it in a search field. He's like, yes, but you said, click on this link and put it in the one box. And there was a great thing about search fields, what they do these days. When you add a search query, it will be kept in history. So he could retrieve 50 other codes and they got bored because search helps you. This is how we look in the IT. When we have a car, we require a driving license. What do you get caught when you're driving? You talk about the traffic rules and the basic in, uh, working of a car. Where's the steering wheel? How do the gear shift work? How does the brake work? That's it. Do you learn how a combustion engine works? Do you learn how the brakes physically work? I know how it works. I, I fix my own car. But you don't need to know it. But then in IT, we look at people like, ah, don't you know that? You don't know about TLS? What kind of user are you? Isn't that weird? We expect people to understand technique as we do. We cannot do that. So very important, when you go to developers, look at them on the same eye height. Listen to them. Have a coffee break. But it's also really great when you look in what Overscan offer you. Don't come with checklists. 
I see the main times like, hey, we have the overs to 10. That's a nice checklist, isn't it? I had a customer say, we do partial overs now. We will do a full overs next year. I was like, full overs? And yes, we'll do the complete overs to 10 next year. I was like, what? Why, how has overs to 10 become a checklist? Because there was nothing else there. Yes, this common vulnerability evaluation, 1,000 entries, and nobody will sign a contract. You cannot, cannot have any of the CVEs in your source code of application. Nobody will sign that. But hey, the top 10 is like 10 points. We can use that. A trick question. What is in the OWASP top 10? Or what is the OWASP top 10 about? Who knows that? I don't ask you about it, what is top A or 1, A2, or whatever. What is the OWASP top 10 about? Most common algorithm wide. Most common what? Most common vulnerability. No. It's about risk. And not the most common one. It's an awareness document. And yes, because of history, we now feed them with data from the past, but it's an awareness document. It's where should you point your attention now? It's not all about data, like, oh, this is very important. The last 10 years we saw this is the, where the most risk comes from. It's an awareness document. The, uh, the Cossack West Forgery came in 2015 from nowhere. Just like, oh, this is new, that might be uh, funny stuff. It's an awareness document. Because nothing else was out there, they used it as a checklist. So we use something that's an awareness document as a checklist, fail. Later, as, if I can recall it correctly, in 2007, we had something new, the OWAS testing guide. OWAS testing guide is about how validate software, not how to write secure software. So we use something, how to validate it, to write the standards, how software has to be. It's not bad, it's a bit better. But still, it's not the same. At least now, the developer know what they will be validated against, what the expectation will be. But still, it's about how to test and not how to write secure software. So what changed everything was the ASGS. That is about expectations you have in software. That's not saying how to do it, but what you do. But is the ASVS for developers? What do you think? No, it's, the developer doesn't decide if you have a two-factor authentication. The developer does not decide if you have a cloud system or a mobile app. He's implementing it. It's for designers and architects. So what do we have for developers? What I see now, it, uh, the ASVS getting better and better, is that now people uh, depend their new tools on the SKF. So for example, the SKF, uh, sorry, on the ACVS, the ACVS has a li list of 185 controls. Do you want for every sprint to go through all the 185 controls? Not applicable, not applicable, yes, no, no, yes, yes, no, you don't want to. Everything we can do repeatedly, we can automate. There's a security requirement automation tool, security red. You put in what kind of application it is, and they will compile the checklist, the partial list of the complete ASVS, what is relevant, and will put them in Chira. Talking about the context where developers live. So there's like, so the what should be done. But then how can we tell them how to do it? Any idea? I gave it away earlier. It's a secure knowledge framework. They were over and over again and again explaining developers what do we should, how you can do it. And they said, hey, we have to automate it. So the secure knowledge framework, again, is like, here you can say, A, on the item in your spend, I'm going to this functionality. This is the ACS list I'm using. That's a type application. That's a type of requirement. So this is how you do it. The how to for developer. And they have code examples in multiple languages, in Java, .NET, Python, PHP, I think, maybe some others. Yeah, Microsoft as well. So they're extending that. So now we have a complete picture helping the developers. Finally, what they also do is the knowledge base, only saying from this is how to do it, also the why, the knowledge base, what is the problem, what you have to consider, and how to solve it. We do the security together. One time I went to a customer and talked to the CISO about, I had to help them with the secure, uh, secure application development, and the CISO said, whom do you want to talk to? I said, of course, I have to talk 
to your business, to your testers, to your developers, to your architects. He was like, all of them? And that is the great thing about security. It's not a one-man business, it's a joint venture. And if you don't understand any company, you will never succeed. And security is sexy, maybe. But you can get more sexy by being understandable, measurable, and enabling. Don't push them off with complexity and expensive. Security is something everybody should do and should be trained by being a craftsman in the technology and by enabling them in a responsible way. So again, when you ever have time, watch the YouTube movie from uh, Ernesto, a tech, uh, called for Ernesto Cialini. If you want to help somebody, shut up and listen. Thank you. Questions? What was that road that you said was exciting? <laughs> the most important thing, it was the Hardanger, uh, the Trollstiegen, I think. I think, I'm not sure. Two uh, weeks of motorbiking. Okay, thanks for a great talk. So I'm on the kind of developer side, I'm a software architect in the company. And I see the security team, we have a security team, they struggle because they're too few. They're basically like four, five people or something. and. On the other side, they have like several hundreds of developers. So do you have any advice how they do their work in that situation? Because they're obviously outnumbered. Yes, the problem is you can do security for them. They have to be aware how you get aware. It's like in the kitchen. You help them enable them. First, appreciation. Then it's software cleanliness, enablement. My analogy is like a kitchen. I can have a dirty kitchen and can produce good food. But on a clean kitchen, I can be easier to produce good food. So their software kitchen has to be clean. The pill pipeline, the code metrics, the code quality tools. Have been, that's the first step. Well-written code, by default, is more secure than badly written code. That's how you start. And they do secure code. Not always means uh, security benchmark, but by quality, encouragement, craftsmanship. That's a step to get there. OK, thank you.